uh, ESPN senior baseball writer Jason Stark. Uh, among other things, we're going to talk to this gentleman about uh, an excellent book of his, which I will hold up to the camera for good plugging purposes here. The Stark Truth, the most overrated and underrated players in baseball history. We have with us uh, the author, Jason Stark. Jason, welcome to the program. Thanks. It is great to be here. I appreciate you having me. Oh, sure, sure. It's a pleasure to have you on. And, uh, again, I've read your book. I, I think that it's just absolutely uh, tremendous. And, and I want to say that, that again, I, I think it serves a purpose even possibly beyond baseball in as much as w one of our pet peeves here on this program is, is historical illiteracy. And, and regardless of the topic, anybody who just thinks that anything that happened five minutes ago is the greatest thing of all time, regardless of anything that's gone on before. And I, I'm sure you, you've seen people like that all the time, I can tell. So I, I appreciate what you've done to, to kind of make us all more aware of some of these guys. There, there's guys in here that I knew stuff about, but not to the degree that you researched them. So I, I, think, it, I think it's a, a good service to uh, baseball fans and, and just uh, in general. Well, I appreciate it. I, I actually educated myself. <laughs> you know, about, about some of these guys, I, it was that's one of the things that really made it fun to do. I, you know, I, I, Babe Ruth was the most underrated left-handed starting pitcher of all time in this book. And look, I, I, I knew this guy was a good pitcher in his time, but even I didn't know until I really immersed myself in it how great he was, how dominating he was. How if you if you, if you stacked up his numbers against Walter Johnson's numbers, you wouldn't be able to tell the difference. And you know that's the kind of thing that really made this book fun to do. Oh, that that's amazing, actually. And when you compare him to Walter Johnson, because I have to say, we we did a, uh, uh, a a vote a couple months ago here on the show, and this was from all walks of life, baseball players, uh, movie stars, etc. Basically, a pantheon, the best of the best uh, for for the greatest uh, pitcher of all time. I voted for Walter Walter Johnson. Good. You know, Good that's oh, thank you. That, I mean, that, that was uh, I had somebody tell me, uh, and, and somebody who knows an awful lot about what they're talking about. Somebody questioned the vote just on the sense that you never saw him pitch. You can't objectively judge him, to which I had to say touche, but I thought the numbers really stood up. But boy, if you're saying Babe Ruth outdid him in a lot of ways, I mean, that's pretty high praise, I think. <laughs> yeah, I think that's safe to say. Obviously, look, it, it, Babe Ruth wasn't a greater pitcher than Walter Johnson because he only did it a few years. But go back and look at the, at the games that they pitched against each other. All right, The first seven times Babe Ruth pitched against Walter Johnson, here was the result. The Babe, six wins. Walter Johnson, one win. And it would have been seven to zero. Uh, Ruth, except for the, uh, the game Ruth lost, he took a shutout into the ninth inning and, and gave up a, uh, gave up two runs in the ninth, or, I'm sorry, blew a two run lead in the ninth. And so it, became, it turned out six one. But that's how great those guys were head to head. And then if you took, look at the two years that, that Babe and Walter Johnson were both full-time pitchers, uh, 1916 and 1917. I mean, it's mind-boggling, but you can certainly argue Babe Ruth was greater than Walter Johnson in those two years. Uh, you know, better ERA, better opponent batting average. It, <laughs> Babe Ruth, we're talking about. Uh, people, when, I, when they read this book, said, how could Babe Ruth be under, underrated? Well, if you look at Babe Ruth the hitter, he's sure not. But if you look at Babe Ruth the pitcher, I think we all might learn something. Oh, yeah. And, and I tell you what, too. It, it actually, it, it was it was kind of funny to me what ended up coming in as a uh, most overrated right-hand pitcher. Because I have to tell you, in that same balloting that we did on the show, and but, but, lest you think ill of us, let me just say that we had some hardcore baseball people like myself in the voting, and we had a lot of uh, more... Uh, run-of-the-mill type fans, people that don't follow the game as much. Nolan Ryan, over my protests, won for greatest pitcher of all time. So that was that was a sore spot of mine right there. And I, you, you made a lot of my arguments for me, Jason. Right, well, and I love Nolan Ryan. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm fine with no, people heaping pays, praise on Nolan Ryan until we get to this point mm -hmm. where people think he's the greatest pitcher of all time or the greatest pitcher of his generation or, in the case of your poll, the greatest right-handed pitcher of all time. <laughs> you know, if, for all the great stuff he did, if he were the greatest pitcher of all time, don't we think he would have won one Cy Young Award? Yeah. I, I mean, don't, don't we think he would have finished in the top three more times than Dan Quisenberry? I mean, that, that's the problem I've got with this. I, again, I love watching Nolan Ryan pitch. Uh, I was so warped that I used to love just 
writing down his box score lines in a little book. I did that for years. Um, I mean, th- this guy, you could certainly make the case he was the most unhittable pitcher who ever lived. Um, there, there are a lot of great arguments you can make for Nolan Ryan, but the greatest pitcher who ever lived, I mean, that's where we start using that word overrated. Oh, absolutely, and, and I like the way that you broke it down as far as your definitions of it, which I, I think were very apropos to the subject matter. I have to say also, the most shocking thing that I found in this book, and, and there's a lot that covers an awful lot of ground here, <laughs> because you unearthed a lot, Jason. This note about the St. Louis Cardinals, not including Rogers Hornsby uh, uh, as, uh, in the balloting in 2006 among their, their five greatest Cardinals of all time, I'm sitting here and I'm thinking to myself, just, what, what, what a travesty that is. It, it, Travis Sham mockery, you could almost say, because, man, the, the only thing I can think of, and it, it, they called it, I think, the Hometown Heroes competition. Right. I, I just, I wonder if maybe it got one, to be one of these warped political correctness things in terms of Rogers Hornsby, again, the, by all accounts, not the most progressive gentleman on racial matters and other things like that. It, maybe they were taking the heroes thing too much literally, but it, it, in that case, it's up to them to make that clear. You cannot exclude him on a factual basis from the top. I mean, that's ridiculous <laughs> on the face of it. I mean, Stan Musial, Bob Gibson, and that's it, you know, as, as, right. and him. When I, when, I, when, I, when I first submitted that chapter, the second baseman chapter, and Rogers Hornsby was one of the five most underrated <laughs> second basemen of all time, my editor said, pardon me? <laughs> you know, that can't be right. But th- th- this is exactly how. I, I, I had an inside source who worked in the home, Hometown Heroes program who let me in on that secret. Now, you know, I, I don't think, uh, my theory on why he was left off uh, it's a little different than yours. Uh, okay. I, I just think for the purpose of modern balloting, and that's what this was, it, it was, a, it was you know, hand out ballots at the ballpark every night so, so people had something to do <laughs> when they weren't in the popcorn line. And they wanted more modern names. And so Albert Pujols was on there, and Lou Brock was on there, and Ozzie Smith, Bob Gibson, Stan Musial. That's five great names. I mean, you, you know, it's, it's not an embarrassment to put those five names on any ballot, but over Rogers Hornsby, you know, you, you could you might be able to make an argument that Rogers Hornsby is the greatest player in the history of the Cardinals, right? You, mm-hmm. I don't know who would argue with you if, you if you said that, and he wasn't on the ballot. Um, I don't know if you want me to go through some of the Rogers Hornsby stuff here, but oh, he's you know, a great now, player. Now, now there's nobody hits 400, right? Mm-hmm. Right. Rod, Rogers Hornsby hit. Over 400, not for one year, but for a period of five years, from 1921 through 1925. For those five years combined, he was over 400. That's it's unheard amazing. Of. That's amazing. Oh my gosh! I mean, and he wasn't. I mean, I go back to the term before uh, historical literacy. I mean, you, you can't use any other term to define, you know, <laughs> snubbing Rogers Hornsby like that. And, and That's right. I, you know, and I tell you what. I mean, unless I sound like too much of a history snob, I'm going to say again: there's a lot that this book illuminated uh, that that I just didn't know about, or or more to the point, maybe didn't realize the full scope of. And I will tell you too that uh, sitting here in our headquarters city of Cleveland, Ohio. How amazing it was for me uh, to, to get the book here at the station and to read this and to crack it open. And what you said about Bob Feller and to realize that everything we're seeing right now with LeBron James really had a direct precedent back in the 40s with Bob Feller. What you said about his, his high school graduation being broadcast on national radio. I mean, <laughs> yeah, we knew this guy was a phenom. I knew that I internalized it, Jason. I don't think I knew the degree. Well, you know, Bob Feller was another guy that I learned a lot about in the course of of writing this book. Uh, you know, I, I mean, one of the reasons that I put Bob Feller as the most underrated right-hander of all time was just to tell all the fun Bob Feller stories. But you're exactly right. Um, you know, one of the reasons that a guy can become underrated is time kind of forgets him. Obviously, if, if we're talking about somebody whose high school graduation was broadcast coast to coast, uh-huh. it, he wasn't underrated in his time. Right. But now, you know, we we just kind of lost how incredible Bob Feller's story was. And you know, the cool thing about the high school graduation was, look, you don't put anybody's high school graduation on national radio unless there's a reason to, right? So, right. Bob Feller. 
had, when he was 17 years old, right, made the first start of his big league career against the St. Louis Browns and struck out 15 hitters in his first start. And three weeks after that, he faced the Philadelphia Athletics, you know, one of the great teams of the era, and struck out 17. He was the biggest strikeout game in the history of the American League. He was 17 years old, and a couple of weeks after striking out 17 Philadelphia A's, he was back home in Iowa riding on the school bus, <laughs> you know, <laughs> to finish out high school. And that's why when it, when it came time to, to graduate, people were kind of interested. More than they might have been otherwise, don't you think? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, it's it's amazing because, again, you know, to, especially growing up in Cleveland. I mean, everybody knows Bob Feller. You know he was a, a, a phenom. But but it's just it's amazing I mean, to, to think of the parallels of, of, of LeBron James. And, yeah. and again, and I, I'm as guilty, I guess, in this as anybody. I mean, he, his story seems almost unparalleled to us. And, and in a sense it is because of the modern media culture. You didn't have that around Feller was there. But if, if, you, if you basically apply the standard standards of the day, he was LeBron James, and that's amazing to make that connection. Yeah, I, I, I invoked LeBron James' yes. name in, the, in that chapter, and not by accident, because I, mm -hmm. I absolutely agree with that. Now, the difference is, you know, we're pretty sure LeBron is not going to go off to war. Right. <laughs> and Bob Feller went off to war, and we don't really know exactly what would have happened had he not, you know, had he just kept on going. But... It's pretty safe to say that he wouldn't be underrated because he'd have he'd have the greatest stats of any pitcher not named Walter Johnson, probably. If 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 the years when he was off to war had gone anything like the years before he went off to war, we'd be looking at, at clearly one of the two or three greatest pitchers in the history of baseball. Mm -hmm. Oh, I, I think that's very, yeah, you made that very clear in that chapter, very convincingly, I thought. And uh, I have to say also, uh, you know, speaking of Cleveland, uh, as far as it goes with baseball today, you know, we might be the one city in America that's unimpressed with Philly suffering for 25 years between <laughs> world yeah, championships. Yeah, a lot of you know? people who told me that, actually. Yeah, exactly, Jason. You know, t to me it reminds me of the old mob movie when they're talking about going to jail. 25 years I could do that standing on my head. You know, we, we've done that in Cleveland here. But, you know, what? how has that been? Of course, you covered baseball uh for the Philadelphia Inquirer, you're you're very familiar with the scene there. I mean, th th this this pent up longing, everything that's happened over the decades uh, here. I mean, w for the Phillies to finally win it here, is is it everything that you thought it would be for the people there? There's no doubt. I'm actually busy working on a book on this phenomenon right now. We're going to call it worth the wait. Um, I, I just hope people in Cleveland get to experience what people in Philadelphia got to experience someday at some point in their lives because it, it's been an incredible phenomenon you know for 20 years 25 years these people woke up every morning and thought to themselves who can i boo today you know, they, they, the tough town anyway but they were frustrated they were mad they were desperate for somebody to win and i, I mean it was just feeding into this gigantic community-wide inferiority complex. And when the Phillies finally won, it's just hard to describe the euphoria. Uh, it, it really shouldn't be possible for something that happens in a sporting event to be able to do this for this many people. You know, there's, just no, there's nothing else in life that bonds people the way something like this did. I, I, I took my daughter to the parade. You know, I'm, I'm not a Phillies fan the way she is, the way all these people are around me, because I'm, you know, I cover baseball for a living. If the Rays had won, that would have been a great story too. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I do live in Philadelphia, and I spent most of my life in Philadelphia. And I, I live in a house full of Phillies fans and Philadelphia fans, and you know, I understood exactly what it meant to these people. I, I mean, for two million people to blow up their lives. And blow off school, blow off work, uh, brave, incredible transportation hurdles beyond the imagination, and show up at that parade uh, on the last day of October was absolutely mind-boggling. Mind-boggling. I, I just can't begin to describe it. And that's this is the beauty of sports. When people debate is it worth spending money to build these stadiums and arenas? It's not an effective use of public funds. I just like to take every one of those people who think it's not 
and plop them down in the middle of that parade and see what incredible psychotherapy <laughs> sports can provide. And I, again, I just hope people in Cleveland get to experience that one of these days. I would be happy to write that book too. Well, uh, as long as we got a uh, good old number uh, 23 here, I think all things are possible. So that, yeah. that could very well happen. It just uh, doesn't look like in baseball anytime soon. But I, I wonder about this as far as different sports go, Jason, and I'm, I'm intrigued to know that you've got this Phillies book on the way. Different metropolises here. There's a totem pole, there's a pecking order as, as, as far as popularity goes. I know in Philly, the, the one thing I can think of off the top of my hand, I know that there's there's always this fanaticism attached to the Flyers. Right now, the Phillies have got to be number one because they're the team that brought it home. Where were they in the pecking order prior to this? Well, that's, another amazing part of that story is that the Phillies were the team that these people had the least faith in. And with good reason. You know, for... for the first 125 years of the franchise, they won one World Series. They won four postseason series in 125 years. I mean, that's fewer than the Marlins, a team that had a 110-year head start. Mm -hmm. And, you know, after they had that great run from 76 through 83, um, you, you can go through nearly 20 years where they only had one winning season. And so they had really fallen off the map in Philadelphia. And so to see the way everything has turned upside down and the way people embrace that team and that group of players has been astonishing. You know, it's, uh, as somebody who loves baseball, it, it's rewarding for me just because I spent so many years of, in that time just trying to defend the sport from people who thought, what's the point? Why are they even playing it anymore? <laughs> I'm never going again. <laughs> and, you know, it, it, things have really come around, and that, and that is very cool. Oh, that has to be. I tell you what, yeah, I mean, you're, you're really wetting my anticipation for this Phillies book. That's going to be uh, great to read. Uh, by the same token, as far as stories go, and, and you, like all writers, I, I know love a good story. I heard you say on Mike and Mike recently here that you thought that the Tampa Bay Rays, that that was uh, one of the greatest stories of all time, what they'd accomplished this year. There were a lot of people comparing it to the Amazing Mets of 69, and there are some parallels uh, as far as being an expansion team that, that went on to do this. But uh, talk about the Rays for a minute here. It clearly is still a very special story, notwithstanding them coming up short. Well, if they'd won, uh, it, it really would have been, uh, for me, the, the greatest team sports story of my lifetime. I, 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 really, I really think so. Um, now, look, the, the fact that they didn't win tempers it a little bit, but that is okay, because I, I still think this is, if not the greatest turnaround story in the history of modern sports. It's in the top two, the top three. I mean, can, when you think about what uh, what a joke that team was, what, that, what, a, what a train wreck that franchise was for a decade, I mean, that, not only were they the losingest team in baseball up until this year in their history, there were only six other teams in the whole sport that were within a hundred losses of them. Mm. Uh, you know, the, the greatest season in the history of the franchise, the greatest season, was a year when they lost 92 games. <laughs> <laughs> and now, here they are, They go one year they have the worst record in the whole sport, the very bottom, and the next year they're in the World Series? Unbelievable! And if they had won, they would have been the first team in the history of any of the four major professional sports to have the worst record in their league one year and win the championship the next year. So look, that didn't happen, but it's still an incredible story. So, uh, and, you know, as I said, I, I mean, if, if the Rays had won, I would have been happy to write that story, even though my, you know, my kids and my wife and all my <laughs> friends would have been miserable. Well, I tell you what, on the subject of the Phillies, let me turn it back to that for the, for the last question here. I, I, I want to see if you get the same vibe from them as of right now that I do, because I get kind of a similar feeling looking at them having just accomplished what they did to the White Sox from three years ago. Granted, the White Sox were much more of a veteran type of team, but as opposed to the two Red Sox teams that won the World Series, and you sat there and said, you know what, with a little bit of tin you know minor tinkering, they could very well be back. The White Sox didn't rest on their laurels. Kenny Williams, say what you will about it. He went out and got Jim Tomey. He made moves that I thought were necessary. I thought they needed to be aggressive to stay on top. I get the same vibe from Philly. They're going to need to be aggressive to stay on top. I don't get that feeling of dominance that kind of the, the Red Sox uh, gave off both times they won the World Series. Do you see it the same way? 
Well, uh, I mean, they're not going to go out and sign CC. No, <laughs> you no, know, they're not. They're, they're not going to be a player for guys like that. But I, I, I do think they understand that a lot of things broke right. Mm-hmm. That they were very lucky in terms of health. Um, that that just a lot of things lined up for them th- this year that are not likely to line up next year. And so, you know, they had it. They had the best bullpen in the National League this year. But to think that all those guys. Are, are, we're going to are going to come back and have the same year is unrealistic, and so you're going to see them go out and and certainly add to that bullpen. They've got to replace Pat Burrell in some way. I'm sure they'll go out and and find a, a couple of bats, um, one to replace Pat Burrell and one just to just to give them more depth and more options. So I, I do agree with that, but I. I I also think that while this was a team really that that was not just built for one year, they're going to have an awfully hard time repeating. Now, what, what's fortunate for them is that you look around the National League and there's really no obvious superpower, so they're going to go into next year as the favorites. And that's not something that's happened in Philadelphia a whole lot. <laughs> no, no, it really hasn't. And uh, I tell you what, this uh, this this forthcoming book that you're working on with the Phillies, I didn't even know about that, but that is going to be tremendous. And we have a link up on our site as well right now to Amazon. Of course, you can also find it in brick and mortar bookstores. The Stark Truth, the most overrated and underrated players in baseball history from ESPN senior baseball writer Jason Stark. Uh, Jason, we always love uh, great conversations on this show. This one certainly uh, fit the bill. It was our pleasure. Thank you, sir. Uh, the pleasure was, was all mine. Uh, thank you very much for having me. Oh, it, it, that's, that was great. Thank you very much. All right. The great Anytime. Jason Stark, everybody. Thank you.